Oxygen is arguably the most important thing human beings need. You can survive weeks without food, days without water, but only a few minutes without oxygen. Its uptake is fundamental and our bodies are constantly doing it, even if we forget about it. In this video we want to take a closer look on oxygen and the Nobel Prize in Physiology 2019, which addresses the question of how the cells in our body are able to sense and adapt to oxygen availability. Why is oxygen actually so important? As you surely know, our body is made up of many small independent units that are called cells. And these cells need energy. Very much like a burning candle or an engine, they need oxygen to win energy by combustion. This process is called cellular respiration. So as a candle could not burn without oxygen, the cells in our body could not generate the energy they need without it. We get oxygen from the air around us by breathing and then it is transported by our blood. But there is a problem and that is that the supply and demand for oxygen changes constantly. Just imagine all the cells which are arranged in complex three-dimensional tissues. Some of them are on the outside, directly connected to the blood and its abundant oxygen supply. But others are hidden, deeper inside, with less oxygen available. Or imagine if you exercise, then suddenly your muscles consume a lot of oxygen and deplete the oxygen levels in your muscle tissues. Or if you go on a mountain, in higher altitude the air pressure will be lower and so suddenly there is less oxygen available. Our cells need to adapt to all those changes, but they can only adapt once they have sensed and registered those changes in the first place. And the discovery of this process is what the Nobel Prize was awarded for. How did research scientists approach this question? Well, that was a combined effort of many laboratories and scientists from all over the world working on this problem for many years. So I cannot go into every detail, but I will just present you the most important milestones on their way. It all started with erythropoietin or EPO. As cycling fans, I know you may know, erythropoietin or EPO is a hormone that stimulates the production of red blood cells. And it was proven that this happens as a reaction to low oxygen, or so-called hypoxic conditions, for example, when you exercise or go to high altitude. So scientists knew there had to be a mechanism that allowed specific cells to sense oxygen to initiate the production of EPO. So, they started by taking a closer look on the EPO gene. In a first set of experiments, they put the EPO gene into transgenic mice. And they found that when they did this, suddenly the mice were expressing the EPO gene in all types of tissues. But when they repeated the experiment with a larger DNA fragment that also contained surrounding regions, then expression was only seen in the kidney, as it is supposed to be. So their conclusion was that those surrounding DNA sequences had to be involved in the oxygen-dependent regulation of EPO. After another series of experiments, where the scientists worked with different variants of the sequence, the downstream region of the EPO gene turned out to be particularly involved. Specifically a very short 50 base pair sequence. This sequence was necessary to allow an oxygen-dependent activation of the EPO gene. So they called it hypoxia response element or just HRE. Scientists then experimented with the HRE sequence and surprisingly it allowed hypoxia-induced expression in a wide range of mammalian cell types. The common belief had been that only cells in kidney and liver possess this oxygen sensing ability because they were the ones that produced EPO. But as this turned out to work in all types of tissues, that already fundamentally changed everyone's understanding. All of a sudden, this seemed to be much more widespread and much more important than everyone had thought initially. The HRE sequence seemed to be very powerful, but why? Scientists found that something was binding to it and purified a protein complex that interacted with the HRE. They call this factor the hypoxia-inducible factor or HIF. When taking a closer look on the HIF, they found that it actually consisted of two different parts. One part had been described already and was called ARNT. ARNT was known to be present at all the time, so this could not be the important factor for oxygen sensitivity. But the other factor, which they now called HIF1-alpha, was not known so far. 
how exactly could HIF-1 alpha now sense oxygen? Further investigation showed that it was actually not always present. Under low oxygen conditions, it was accumulating and then initiating the transcription of EPO, but under high oxygen conditions, it was constantly destroyed. And again, scientists could pin this behavior down to a specific short part of a protein. They identified a structural domain in HIF1-alpha and called it oxygen-dependent degradation region, or just ODD. They showed that the deletion of this region prevented degradation and led to a stable, undegradable variant of HIF1-alpha, even with the presence of oxygen. Conversely, adding the ODD to an otherwise totally stable protein like GAL4 conferred an oxygen-dependent instability. But why was it only destroyed under high oxygen? It turned out that a protein which had been investigated for a long time already was important for this. This protein was called von Hippel-Lindau, or VHL. It was a key breakthrough when researchers found that VHL could recognize and bind to HIF1-alpha, and that this led to the proteasomal degradation of it. It was then suspected that only an oxygen-dependent modification of HIF1-alpha, called hydroxylation, could allow VHL to bind. And this turned out to be the case. An oxygen-dependent hydroxylation of the ODD increased the affinity of HIF1-alpha to VHL. And when researchers ultimately also found the proteins responsible for this modification, they had the final piece of the puzzle. In summary, in the absence of oxygen, hydroxylation cannot occur and VHL does not recognize HIF1-alpha. Because of this, it is not degraded and remains intact. It can then accumulate in the nucleus, together with AND, it binds to the HRE and activates the expression of hypoxia-induced genes. However, under normal oxygen levels, HIF1-alpha is modified and bound by VHL and that leads to its rapid degradation in an oxygen-dependent manner. We now know that over 300 genes have a hypoxia response element and are potentially regulated in an oxygen-dependent manner. This includes almost all enzymes involved in energy metabolism and almost all types of cells and tissues. So that's a very fundamental physiological process at the basis of all multicellular life. Further, this mechanism turns out to be medically highly relevant. In fact, VHL was originally known because it was observed that it could inhibit certain types of tumors. It was only later that we then finally understood why and what the function of this protein actually is. Generally, cancers grow very fast and uncontrolled and this means they usually have an increased demand for oxygen. So there are now clinical trials for different drugs underway. Some increase HIF function, and that might allow us to increase the production of red blood cells, which will be very valuable for anemia patients. Others decrease HIF function, and that might maybe one day allow us to fight certain types of cancers. <laughs>